She is working in the Bay Area, both on uh, glass fixtures, lighting design, and products for your home. And um, I want to just quickly share my screen, and we have some slides to look at first. And then we're going to get into an amazing live studio tour with Jess. So uh, you'll see me on camera, but off camera uh, is my wife, Printmaking 03, Shannon Betty, who's going to be handling the Q&A. Um, as we go through the presentation, the slides and the thing, uh, feel free to click on the Q&A button um, in your Zoom and add any questions you might have. And we're going to be addressing those um, throughout as well as, you know, more toward the end. So feel free to grab all those questions that you have for, for Jess and we'll address those. Um, wanted to introduce Jess again. Um, <laughs> Jess is someone that um, I have known for quite a while. And um, we have, I think, a really great treat in stock today for seeing some of her work and seeing her creative space as well. Uh, Q&A for your questions. So I think with that, Jess, um, I'm going to pass it over to you. All right. Thank you so much, Jared, for having me and for the intro. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, so today I'm gonna, we're gonna run through some slides and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about some finished large scale blown glass illuminated sculptures and light installations that I've created mostly for residential spaces in Silicon Valley, but also throughout the Bay Area. Um, this first piece is called the Stone Sphere. I wanted to show you some images of finished works to give you some context when we look at what's in my studio. Um, so this piece is a pendant light and I'll, I'll save the details on the process and what it's about for when we go through my space. Next slide, please. Uh, here's two more views of that pendant. And you can see the stone wall that inspired this piece, both in the left and right images. These are two different vantage points. The home is a really interesting U-shape. And so when we're looking at the image on the left, we're looking from the master bed bedroom down a really long hallway. And you can see this stone wall and a little cubby that goes up to the reading nook. And then on the right side is the other vantage point, which is sort of the big grand entryway when guests enter the home. Um, so we're gonna come back to that one. Next slide, please. So this piece is actually for that same home, uh, but it's in the lounge bath and I call that the tree lantern. So what you're seeing behind the glass piece is actually not wallpaper. It is a light projection. So in this piece, I blew a glass form. I made a drawing of the oak trees that are outside of my client's home. I sandblasted them onto the glass and then did a bunch of electrical experimentation to figure out how to get that to become a projection screen. And for this piece, I really wanted, this is sort of a lounge bathroom that's adjacent to a space that these clients do a lot of entertaining in and they watch TV and play pool and hang out and have cocktails. And so I wanted this to really feel like a magical forest that either they or their friends were entering. Um, so we'll, we'll actually dive into that and I'll show you some samples and the drawings that inspired that when we, a little bit later. Next slide, please. And so this is actually the room that I was talking about where they hang out and play pool. Um, this installation, I call it the river light. You can see in detail on the right that there's sort of a clear polished trough that was cut and polished into these flat white glass plates that I created. And it sort of creates this undulating river line that when they're illuminated and it's nighttime, it projects sort of a, a vague version of a river on the ceiling. And so those pucks are LED, custom LED pucks that shine up. And so you get this up image. Um, and then on the left, you can see a little bit of, um, we can't see the slope, but the ceiling is actually curved up. And so part of the idea of having a winding river was re relating to that 
curved ceiling in the architecture. Um, next slide, please. And so this is the dining table light. Um, actually, for the same home, I worked on this project uh, for several years and ended up making eight large scale installations for it down in Atherton. Um, for this piece, you can see some little fine lines on each of those glass parts, and they are um, segments of the wood grain from the wood planks that are below the dining table. So the concept with all of these pieces is I wanted them to have the fingerprints of the home, either the architecture or the materials. And so you'll see as we get into the material samples, um, kind of what inspired those and how, how I found little pieces and parts of the house to bring into the glass. Uh, next slide, please. And this is a large piece that is sort of the centerpiece that you see as you drive up the driveway. And these clients really love ice and water. There were a lot of elemental uh, inspirations for these works. And so um, this was sort of a melting, dripping, icy, large sculpture. And you see it as you come up. It's kind of the centerpiece of the home. Definitely reminds me of like walking into like an ice cave somewhere and having everything dripping down from below and above. Awesome. Yes, totally. And then next side, please. And so this is another view, the night view. I don't know if you've been in an ice cave in the evening. I, I've never had the chance to go into an ice cave, but it sounds pretty awesome. Um, here's another view of that piece. And then next slide, please. And then this is the home and this is sort of the view as you're entering. So you would walk up that pathway and you see it in that main 18 foot tall uh, window. And then next slide. And so this is the last piece that I'm gonna show you before we dive into the actual glass. And so this is a different home that's in Palo Alto. Um, and I'm going to dive a little bit deeper into kind of what my design process looks like, what the phases are using this as the example. And so the detailed work that you can see on the piece on the right, those are little abstracted segments of the Persian rugs that this client collects. They have a pretty amazing Persian rug collection. And so I spent a lot of time with the palette and the patterns and the line work in their rugs and that ended up being kind of the most compelling component to work off of for um for the pieces so i think that that's all we've got on the deck and so i'm gonna jump off and switch to my phone Sorry about that. Um, Jess is switching over to her phone um, so she can walk around her studio and uh, we'll be able to ask questions then. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A section at the end. Welcome back, Jess. Uh, you might want to turn your phone sideways. It might be a better, there we go. Yep, perfect. Awesome. Uh, I'll mute and you're back on. Can I see what I'm looking at though, Jared? I can't hear you. Uh, I, I'm, I mean, can you see the view from your phone? Turn the camera around so that it's not the deck. Yep. There you go. Um, I'm going to stop presenting right now. Okay. Okay. Oh, wonderful. Here we are. Okay. Great. So I'm just going to do a quick pan so you can get an overall view and then we'll zoom in. This is my studio. It's in Fruitvale, California. That's a part of Oakland. I've been in this space for probably eight years. Um, and this building has been around for about a hundred years. And so I wanted to dive into, you know what? I was gonna start with this, but I'm not sure if you can see it super well with the bright light. I think we're good. We'll start here. So these are the boards that I created to kick off 
the project in Palo Alto that I ended with, the Persian rug project. And so I just wanted to start with, so in all of the lighting projects I do, I start by sort of doing a discovery phase, much like any design project, whether it's digital design or physical design. And I just spend time with the home. I visit at various times of day. I try to experience it in different weather conditions. And from that, I get kind of the pillars or the themes that the work is gonna be about. And so this is a board from that. It's about um, the plant life that's around the home. And they actually have a horticulturist who works for them. And these are really special lily pads. And so I just spent some time taking photographs, making drawings of the plant life that was really compelling to me. And here's some more shots. And they also had a pretty spectacular art collection. And so these are some very old prints and some Ansel Adam. Um, and then these were the other pillars. So they have these wonderful lanterns. The home was built in, 20, in 1935. It was early Californian architecture, which is Spanish inspired. And so you can see there's a terracotta tile roof. This was the original light that I was hired to replace. You can see all of this beautiful original metal work. And this is a little branch from outside their home. And you can see a little corner of the carpet and some other interesting objects. And then I just came in and spent some time drawing what I saw, photo doing more photography. These were some beautiful metal lights that I thought were really interesting. So I spent hey, some time. Yes. While you're kind of in this phase of your design process, yeah. how, how important is it that the, the work that you do kind of have like both a, a, a presence during the day maybe not illuminated and as well as a presence kind of at night as an actual kind of luminary? That's a fantastic question. Um, you know what, I'm gonna just turn my camera for a moment and I'll talk to you guys and then I'll come back to the, to the boards. Um, so in this, in this home, that was the most important because it's actually kind of a dark home. And even, you know, there's such a range in different projects. Some people are like, this needs to be Ill about illumination. Like we're hiring you. Yes, we want a piece of artwork, but we want to brighten this space. And for other people, it's really just a sculpture and it happens to turn on. And sometimes I make sculptures that don't turn on at all. Um, so I guess the answer is it really depends on the architecture. It depends on the client and the space. Um, I'll flip this back around. In this space, this was an entryway, but it's kind of on the darker side. And um, it was really just supposed to bring warmth and style and something that spoke to what the, the home was about. And it was less important that it was really bright. Um, this was a drawing of the original uh, glass, sort of octagon glass form that I was replacing. And there were all kinds of things that were interesting that I dove into before I landed on the carpets. But then you can see on top here, these are, this is just the amazing range of colors and patterns. There, there's a lot of red in their home. They're also very into music and they have a lot of amazing musical instruments. So there was a period of the discovery phase where I thought potentially I would incorporate some musical instruments in the works. And so then from there, um, you know, I'm gonna, I actually think that we can't see these as well as we want. And so we're gonna move to a less bright environment. So these are um, some details of the carpet that I liked the best. I love this like bright salmon color. This was another really interesting, it was sort of like a vessel form, a flower form, a splat. There was this kind of mirror image, but it was imperfect. 
And I was just really moved by that. And I thought there was so much in there that was really interesting. And so these are some of the sort of early drawings that I made. And I, I, these films are basically, I do the original drawing on the film and then it, I do a photographic transfer of this onto a sticky film that becomes like a stencil. And so when I was testing out what the palette was gonna be for these pieces, this is an example of one of the samples that I made and I made them in a huge range of colors. Um, and you can see these sort of more vibrant gold and sort of a ivory color. And I, I wanted them to go for this one, but too colorful. This is sort of a salmon, again, going back to this original inspiration with a gold. Um, and in the end, we ended up going with something quiet and kind of back to Jared's original question, you know, oftentimes we'll make color decisions based on the illumination question. And so in a sort of darker space, doing something more colorful is gonna let less light in and doing something that's more translucent and lighter is going to let a lot more light in. So this is very similar to the tallest one in the trio. And you can see the contrast between the reflectivity and the frosting. And that too is part of how it behaves when it's not illuminated. So when the light isn't on, there's still something compelling and interesting and shiny that picks up parts of the room, picks up light, coming through the windows. So um, there are lots of ways to activate these lights when it's not daytime. Um, so I also wanted to show you the tree lantern, kind of the earlier phases there. So this, these are some photos that I took of the shadows from the live oak trees outside of that home. And I just really, I grew up in the woods in Ohio and uh, I've always loved trees. I've loved drawing trees in my RISD application. I definitely drew some of the trees behind my parents' house. And so that's always been, nature has been a huge theme in my work. And so here's a larger drawing, which would later become a film, much like what I showed you with the, the carpet piece. And so this is the larger drawing. And then these are, um, this is a close up of two of the other tree lanterns. I, I made them in three sizes and the middle one is the one that is in my client's home right now. Um, and I just put out this little light because this was the, the illumination in a kid's toy that created the same kind of projection that I wanted to create. So I bought the toy and I dismantled it. And I took this little light to my electrician and we basically rebuilt this in a permanent hardwired assembly, which is what illuminates the piece that's hanging in the home and creates the uh, projection. Are we doing good on time, Jared? Yep, it's 620. Um, if Thank you have you. a moment for uh, another question. Um, yeah. I'm curious, you know, you, you definitely, you made in class. How much have you had to kind of branch out and learn about things like, uh, you know, electronics and, you know, kind of more the kind of technical side of lighting design um, as, as kind of your work has progressed? That is a great question. And getting into lighting really asked me to branch out hugely. Um, so the electrical component, you know, my philosophy with all the work I make, whether it's illuminated or not, is basically concept first, then design, then figure out how to make it. Um, and I've been very fortunate with the clients that I've had that they're typically really supportive of that progression. Um, and so what it means sometimes is there's a lot of learning to figure out how we're technically going to build things. And so for the tree lantern, the electrical experimentation, there's sort of an electrical wizard who works 
at this little shop in Berkeley and he's got like big white curly hair and he knows everything about electronics. And so he sort of became an expert partner um, in that project. And I went back there a bunch of times and we did, you know, he sold me potentiometers and we're like testing levels and all these different types of light bulbs until we got the perfect one. Um, and then beyond electronics, you know, there's metalworking, there's engineering considerations, balance and weight. And uh, I have sort of a team of people who are electricians, metal workers, people who help me with the design and the creation of the armature for especially these larger pieces. Um, but then also I, in, in the stone sphere, which I'm about to get to, um, there are times when there are aspects of the glass process where there's a skill that is not my forte but is something that I maybe took a class at RISD in and haven't used since then. And so in those cases, I'll hire other glass blowers to sort of team with me to like, for example, do lost wax casting. So I'll flip this back around and then we'll sort of come back to that in a moment. I just wanted to give you a close up of the um, Encolmo pieces, which this was the, the wood print from the dining table. And these are actually me, the, the, the wood grain thief. Um, I took tracing paper, I traced the wood grain, and then I sort of pulled drawings out of this and abstracted it enough to make it more graphic, clearer, and more readable as sort of distinct parts of the flooring. And so these were also some earlier, the color was really significant on this piece. Um, one theme in the home is that there's tons of windows and green and nature and plant life is very present from every view. And um, so this was sort of an easy, early doodle where I was like, you know what, I want a little pop of green I want to bring in something of this natural palette. Um, so that's how we got to the green on the inside. And when you're sitting below this piece, you get sort of a little peekaboo of illuminated green when it's on from below. Um, and here is, you know, just a little mock up showing like what's it going to look like in the room. And then this is a foam model of that piece. Um, I'll rotate a little so you can see it. And so oftentimes with larger works, I will build a full scale model. And in this case, the spacing and relationship between the different pieces really had a different personality and feeling from the different vantage points three sides are our windows and actually from the other side of the u um, back where i was talking about the stone sphere that's part of this sort of u shape you can see this through double windows across a courtyard and so um, these little tabs are we i like we built scaffolding i hung this in the room that it was going in before it was furnished and with my clients we adjusted and perfected kind of the assembly so that it would be exactly the arrangement that made sense. Um, so. How's that, how's that process of inviting your clients into your studio and co-designing with them? They, they never come here. I go there. <laughs> um, they're welcome. They're welcome. But in general, uh, most of my clients are super busy. And so I am um, coming into their space on their schedule. And so I bring this into their home and we hang it in their home. I hang it in here and you can actually see, um, you know, sometimes I have to build more heavy duty structures. This is a board that I mounted up there that I've hung other. So the, the sort of melting ice piece um, this was one of the many prototypes 
that I made of that. And so that hung from that sort of dot board that was over there. And so, yes, that is, that is the answer. Um, uh, they typically don't come here. They, they, they are welcome. They could come here if they, if they had the time. Um, so I wanted to move on to the stone sphere. So as I was saying, um, this, this was a lost wax casting process, which is something I did take a class at RISD in, but hadn't done since then. So I hired somebody who does a lot more casting and we, um, I basically sculpted a wax positive of this form. We, I, we made a rubber mother mold of it so we could make multiple, which is basically just brushing on liquid rubber and then that peels off. And then we have like as many of the wax positives as we want or need. Um, and so for this one, you can see this is sort of like an asymmetrical unique form as we were doing the trial and error, when we were blowing this one out, we blew too hard, the mold shattered, the piece caved in, but I kind of loved this object. And so I have it and it's mine now, um, but it did take us three goes to get that. And to sort of backtrack a little bit on this one, um, back to kind of like what the, the discovery phase for this particular project was, as I had pointed out earlier, that stone wall was really unique and really interesting to see on the interior of a home. And there was also this reclaimed wood, which was gorgeous and very unexpected as an interior material. And so when I was doing the discovery for this project, I spent a lot of time with that wood um, so this was a rubbing. I did a bunch of rubbings. I did like, you know, contour line drawings, other drawings of the texture. It was sort of a fuzzy wood texture. We ladled hot glass onto it and made a burn. Here's, here's our burn test. More rubbings, more rubbings. Hey Jess, we have a question on the yeah. specifically Great. around how you make your textures. So I, I'm, you're covering a lot of it right now. I just want to make sure that you had you knew that the audience was curious about this. About texture, yeah. yeah. So maybe I'll keep going, and if I haven't right. answered right, it, yeah. they more can broadly pop the, back the in. designs and the textures. So I think this is probably covering both the the etching that you're talking about earlier, as well as these textures you're talking about now. Yes, awesome, great question. Um, so sort of getting more detailed in here. When I think about texture, the texture that's created from the line drawings with like the, um, the Encolmo wood grain and the tree lantern and the carpet piece, those are very controlled. That is a texture that's just the outcome of the process of doing the sandblasting. And the texture on this was because I wanted this stone sphere to feel like that stone wall. And so all of these rubbings and contour line drawings and ladle tests, those are ways for me to get a deeper understanding of what that texture is about, what's unique about it, what are the things that I missed when I like first glanced at that wood. Um, and so, you know, here's another detail of that stone wall. It's just the crevices are really interesting, the texture. Um, this was sort of an inspiration board of uh, the Wailing Wall and different, different walls that came to mind. Um, and this was an early test, which was in the kind of figuring out of like, how am I gonna transform this flat, planar stone wall that's made out of blocks of stone into glass? And so in the early experiments, I bought some extruded steel pipe and had it cut down and we blew hot glass bubbles into those to kind of make building blocks and so um, the earliest version these were going to be distinct blown blocks that i was going to assemble into a sphere um, and there were a couple you know thinking about could there be an armature on the outside 
Could it be this sort of odd form that's not really a sphere? And what ended up happening in these drawings and in those early blocks that I blew in the hot shop, we really identified that a, a design constraint that was given to me by the owners, which really was the right feedback, was that all of those ideas included way too much metal armature. And so we needed to scale back and that's where getting into doing a single vessel and doing it with a lost wax casting then we had very minimal metal work. We basically just had one light source, a custom fabricated metal top and a stem, and then we were there. And so um, that's sort of how we got there. Um, and then I wanted to, what, what, can you give me another time check, Jared? Yep, we're at 6.32. Beautiful. So I wanted to switch gears a little bit and show you kind of the other side of my work. Um, so I've, we've spent a lot of time on the whole process of how I create the larger scale lighting and some of the various types of, oh, one more that I wanna show you before we jump off. I wanted to show you just one of the parts from that sort of, um, the large melting ice piece. And so I just wanted to show you the side view so you can kind of get a sense of that object. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, I wanted to sort of dive into the other side, maybe the more personal side of my work. Um, so making bowls and, and vases and drinking glasses and just home decor objects that are functional and accessible has been a part of my work since I left RISD. I love making gifts for people. I love the process of sort of working with someone, finding something really special for housewarming or birthday presents. And so um, these are some inspiration sort of concept, they're not really drawings, they're photographs that I took in Wonder Valley, California, that I cut into vessel forms and were the inspiration for a collection of desert sunrise vessels that I made. Um, I also love when the light is really dark blue gray and it's about to storm and you can kind of see that contrast between the beige sand and the dark stormy sky. Um, these were some other dawn uh, concepts. And then these were some sky vessels. Um, so this is one of the desert sunrises. I'm going to go around because I think our light is going to be better from over here. Um, so that's one of the dawn pieces. And um, these are some of the sky vessels. And so I just, the idea of daydreaming, of laying in the grass and looking at a cloudy sky is such a serene, wonderful, thoughtful time that's really important in my life and my creative process. And so I was really excited to work on developing some sky pieces. Um, this is a sky bowl, it's food safe and cloudy and light. Um, and then this also is part of the sort of brighter, more colorful desert sunrise collection. And this color, these require more handling and light. I'm just gonna take you to the light so that you can see this kind of fire op opal color, which is really um, one of my favorites. And so I, I love cooking, I love entertaining. And so making these really large colorful bowls is sort of an ongoing part of my process. No matter what other pieces I'm working on, I love to just go into the shop and spend a day making large bright pieces. So, and then this is 
a little experiment for maybe a new collection that I'll work on at some point. It's, um, tur it's turquoise. I see something in the chat. Shall I ch click on it or do you want to tell me, Jared? I can read them out. Uh, the question yep. from Lee Lippert is, where is your glass kiln located? Mm. So I work out of a studio in Oakland called Glow Glass Studio. It's owned by a guy named Alex Abasian, who's actually also a RISD alum and a dear friend of mine and has been a workmate for a de an entire decade. Um, and he has helped me create a lot of these pieces. Um, so it's about 10 minutes away and around the time when I moved into this space, I'll just move back here. I'll, I'll, uh, talk to you guys. When I moved into this space, I really, um, it was important for me to delineate between, between a thinking, designing, clean space where I could build models and I could store work and I could just let my mind go wherever it needed to go. And the hot shop, for those of you who haven't been in a hot shop, is loud, there's rap music blasting, there's torches and propane and whirring and yelling and wind and the whir of like the oven is just on all the time. And so, for me, with the way I work creatively, it's really important for me to have a sanctuary space, which this space is really that for me. Um, so that's why I have them separate. Um, so a little, I'll just do a quick run through. These are some more of the vessels. These are thumbprint vessels with um, these sort of ear-like shapes on them. Another desert sunrise. Many, many more of the sample, color samples that we tested before we got to that final one uh, for the Persian rug uh, project. And here's some more large bowls. Lavender, purple is my favorite color, even though it doesn't make it into my glasswork all that much. This is a totally wild, kind of pearlescent black with a slightly metallic interior. And these pieces were actually kind of the classic original piece that I created that inspired all of this lighting work that has the sandblasted technique on it. Um, so these works uh, are made in much the same way. And I basically make a drawing of this chrysanthemum, which is tattooed quite large on my back. Um, so the first doodle was for the tattoo and the second doodle became uh, this sort of like classic uh, design that is, shows up in many of my drawings and many of my glass pieces. Um, and then it sort of branched off and some other more personal applications of the drawing process. Uh, passion flowers are some of my favorite flowers. This is a, a pendant light, which is not wired yet. Um, and when I moved to California, I was actually gifted a passion flower plant that I had in Providence and it made it out to California and survived. And so to me, passion flowers really represent California and a lot about kind of my move to have a wilder, freer Californian life. Um, so those are important to me personally. This is another, it's a little hard to see as our lights sort of go down, but this is another sculptural work with some sandblasted line drawings that I made of faces. Hey Jess, we have another question um, yeah. about where you do your work. Um, Lee asks, is your etching, sandblasting, and grinding done at the hot shop or somewhere else? It is done at the hot shop. So in addition to the furnace and the glass blowing equipment being there, I actually rent another very small kind of desk space where when my pieces come out of the kiln, we put them on the work table there and I have my sandblasting films. And the, the unit that I use for the sandblasting 
uh, to make the film is actually very small. And um, so that stays in my little workspace there. And there's a sink with a washout. There's a special, um, there's a special sort of head that you have to attach to the faucet to make the films. You don't need any chemicals, it's just water, but um, the spray out I do in the sink over there and they, I hang them to dry, I have lines and clips. And then I run over there, I pack up the pieces from here and I take them there, I prep them and we have a sandblasting closet that I rent when I'm over there. And then I bring them back here and I ship them all over the world to whoever wants to buy them. Um, here are some more works that I did with the line drawings. These are all faces, some larger works with the chrysanthemum. There's an oh. artichoke. Hey, Jess, yes. a clarification question about your water faucet. Is it a water jet? No, so it is... I'm sorry for not bringing it here. It's basically a hose, it has an attachment and there's just a hose and it makes a, it's not pressurized that much. It doesn't, it's just a little more pressure and a little more directional. What I'm doing with my hand is the shape of the opening that gets attached to the faucet. And so it sprays like a flat fanning line, which you go, Similar motion to if you were spray painting something, it's just an even washing motion. You don't want to soak the film. I can, at another point, I can do a depth. There's, there's actually a video that I can send out after this um, that shows me doing the whole process with the washout and hanging the films. Uh, but no, it is it definitely less involved than a water jet cut. Um, and so a couple more chrysanthemums and passion flowers. And um, sort of going back to the very beginning, these ceramic pieces have a technique on them called sgraffito, which is basically when the clay is leather hard, you can stain it, you haven't fired it yet, and you can carve into it. And traditionally, the sgraffito designs were look like woodcut. Um, in my case, I just do a lot of line work and I started working with ceramics. Um, that was sort of my original work. These are some personal sculptures that I made. Um, <clears throat> and when I was exploring the sgraffito technique with ceramics, I really wanted to translate that to glass. And so learning about this light sensitive film, um, allowed me to transform this process that I had known and loved in clay into glass. Um, and then here's, you know, another early ceramic work that's got some sgraffito on it. Um, I think, I think we're good. Jared, can you tell me the time one more time? It is 6.45. Perfect. I think that I'll switch back to my computer and um, we can do the Q&A. Are you guys ready for that? Sounds good. Okay, great. Hmm. I know we had some uh, questions uh, for Jess um, as we walk through the studio. If you have any other questions about, you know, process or anything else, um, please add those to the Q&A now and um, we can, interject some audience questions with some other questions that we got ahead of them too. Welcome back, Jess. Almost. Thank everyone for joining us on this Thursday evening. I know some of y'all are on the East Coast and it's getting kind of late, so I appreciate your time. Um, if you haven't joined any of the other RISD events, uh, you know, please do get on those mailing lists. Um, there's a lot of one, great ones that have happened, a lot of good ones that are coming up. So um, feel free to join those, the mailing list, so you know when those are happening in the future. Welcome back, Jess. Thank you. So I had one question uh, that kind of came up when I was thinking about you doing your client work earlier. 
Um, you know, I see a lot of the work that you have kind of done um, that's more, I would say, fine art pieces compared to the functional pieces that are kind of, you know, kind of writing that line. How do you balance your personal aesthetic with what your clients ask for? That's a great question. I think in general, I've been pretty lucky to fall on these projects in super modern homes that actually really align with what I love and am called to make work about aesthetically. So like the project in Atherton, which was a huge chunk of time and many pieces, um, Ken Linstead is the architect who designed that home and I love his work. And I didn't realize that he was the architect until I arrived for the site visit. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, so oftentimes I luck out is the answer to that. And periodically, if the home is less aligned, I would say I'm a pretty curious person. And so, um, I can find things that are really compelling and interesting in just about any space. And so even though like early California architecture is not necessarily um, my thing, uh, I found a ton that I thought was really fascinating and compelling in that home. So it can, it can come anywhere. And, and I'm also interested in the collaborative part of the process my end goal is that the people who buy the lights from me are so happy and they love sitting under them and it makes them happy to have that as the illumination in their home. And so I'm not super attached to it needing it to look like a Jess Wayne or whatever that looks like. I have no idea what that looks like. Um, I'm more interested in kind of like that relationship and learning from them what they want it to be and really coming to something that's going to bring something meaningful to their space. Um, so, yeah. Can you like think about all the work that you've kind of just done as your own through your home goods line or, or through client work, what work do you actually enjoy doing the most? Well, I love blowing glass. That's kind of the ultimate. I mean, anything that, in the beginning, I think it was like anything that pays me to stay in the hot shop keeps me happy. I think that glass is hands down the most magical, fascinating material I've ever come in contact with. So just being able to work with the material hot and observe its optics, that's endlessly inspiring for me. Um, but I would say that, you know, in, in the last few years, spending more time in the desert in Joshua Tree and Wonder Valley, uh, those are places that feel really fertile for me and uh, very deep. Um, I think that there's, there's deep roots in the desert in my lineage. And so when I went there, there was something like bigger than my own experience of being there. And so I I think that's part of it. And I think just the experience of being away from civilization, watching the sunrise and just feeling the newness of like what a new day means and seeing those colors and making a piece about that hope and that experience. I would say that that's the most meaningful for me personally, making, making those works, the sunrise pieces. I have a couple questions from the audience now. Great. Uh, one from Lee, uh, who was about the qu process questions earlier. He said, thinking about process is important. How do you see your process having evolved from RISD and now after graduating? That's a great question. I think I actually kind of came back to my studio practice that I developed at RISD when I reached the point in my career where there were bigger projects with more creative freedom. Um, in the years immediately after RISD, I was teaching drawing. I was doing a lot more functional work. I was selling bowls and vases to the SF MoMA and I had a product line and it was a lot more about trying to get the numbers up to, you know, sell work and survive. And then um, once I sort of came out of that and I got into spaces where people were hiring me because they liked my perspective they liked my ideas and they wanted to be in a collaborative space with me where it was like, oh, like we're getting to know each other. I'm learning all this deep stuff about 
what your preferences are, what, how you're going to use the space, what your life experiences have been. Um, I think once we got into that deeper process, it brought me right back to all of the discipline, all of the research, all of the detail that was cultivated at RISD. So, yeah. Another question from our audience. Um, did working with the shadow projections come from your own interest or a client request? And then more generally, are projected shadows a theme in your work? Uh, and Linda also says your work is beautiful. Oh, thank you. Definitely a theme in my work. Definitely from me and not really from them. Um, generally with these bigger pieces, there isn't really a lot of design input from the clients in the beginning. In the conceptual phase, those are all coming from me. I'm bringing it to them. I'm kind of reacting to the space, the site, the landscape architecture, who they seem like they are and how they're gonna use the space. And so um, it's, it's very unusual when a client says, I want a yellow piece that looks like this. And usually when that happens, I kind of push back. Um, I think that inviting that feedback and that collaboration a little bit later, once I'm sort of in a flow of inspiration about what I wanna make the work about, I think that that creates the best result. Awesome. Um, we, you talked a bit about being uh, in the desert and that being kind of something that inspires you. Um, now that most of us are stuck indoors, um, what do you do to kind of boost your creative energy in your studio? I did see uh, a, a trampoline there in the corner. Anything yes. else that you do to boost your creative energy? Um, I bought the trampoline because my friends in New York City who have been even more confined during COVID than we have, they are very into the mini trampoline. Um, so that's more that's just that when I come here, I like to bounce on it. it. It's fun and it makes my day a little bit more fun. But for inspiration, um, I think that it's just sort of constantly coming. I, I teach a drawing class on Sundays that is all ages, all experience levels. So there are people that we went to RISD with who are in the class. There's a six-year-old and an eight-year-old. There are people in their 70s. There are people who've never taken a drawing class. And I've learned so much from all of those different perspectives. And we do a lot of work that's very much like foundation drawing from RISD. We do blind contours and we blindfold ourselves and touch objects and draw them. And so I, I get a lot of inspiration there. Shannon, were you wanting to jump in? Did I hear you for a moment? No, sorry. Um, so yes, I mean, I would say the drawing class has been the biggest source. Cool, another question was, what is the most memorable response you have had to your work? Hmm. I mean, I think that when my clients are just really happy, I remember it. I, I, there, there have been, there are the, the folks in Atherton do periodically like send me a beautiful photograph that they've taken of some of the works like at dusk. And that's really delightful for me. Like it's been a long time uh, since I made some of those pieces and just that they're still loving them and experiencing them and seeing them with new eyes and with new perspective has been pretty awesome. So. It's, it's probably pretty nice that like, you know, given that it's like not, you know, representation, it changes the way like people might perceive it throughout the day, throughout their life. And just like seeing them kind of reinterpret it might be very interesting. Totally. Awesome. Um, I don't think we have any other questions from folks that have joined in. Um, is there anything else you would like to chat about or share with I everyone? I see one question here that says, why are you drawn to glass? Um, I could just hop in and yeah, answer that one. Um, I think to me, glass is... The process of working with glass is really interesting because the outcome is delicate and fragile and shiny and kind of feminine in a way. 
Um, but the process is pretty burly. It's sweaty, it's dirty, it's heavy. It requires strength and coordination and ultimate focus. Um, and so I think that like that kind of tension and dichotomy of like these two opposing forces, there's like a masculine feminine energy in it that's really interesting. And then also just visually, I think shiny objects are probably, it's a human thing that we respond to shiny objects. And I think that there's so much that you can do with glass and just, you know, that we're able to make an object that like, you know, has these organic forms. Um, I just think that that's, it's endlessly interesting trying to kind of freeze into this moment in time. It's like dripping and gravity is working against you and you have to work fast and you have to continuously reheat it. And so I think that that, that energy and that activity is really compelling for me. Uh, we have another question uh, from the audience. Um, I like the notion of a solid form creating art that ethereal, shadow, and focus is viewable, but untouchable. Mm. It's like touching water. It's fragments and distorts the image reflected. Mm. Beautiful comment. I think so much of your work like does reflect the natural world. So that's very interesting that it's like totally. you know, it's kind of you know set in time. Yes, absolutely. I love that. Thank you, Catherine. Was there a question that I missed on that one or a more well, of a Catherine comment? Just says she's impressed with your work and the gorgeous yeah. installations and the rigor behind them. Thank you. Um, wonderful. Awesome. We have some uh, links. I'm just going to go back and project for a moment. Yeah. And I just wanted to uh, throw up Jess's uh, Instagram and web addresses. Do you want to talk briefly about what the two are for people? For who sure. Sorry, there's a lot going on here. Um, so for Instagram, Wayne Star is more of my day to day. There's a lot about color, inspiration, samples, you know, the photography, things that I'm thinking about. If I go to the desert, there's definitely photos of that on my on my Wayne Star account. Jess underscore Wayner is more for finished works. It's focused on lighting. It's more tightly curated and I do less frequent posting on that. And for the two websites, JessWayner.com again is focused on lighting. Um, that's more kind of polished finished works that are installed into homes. Jess Wayner Home is actually a brand new site that I built pretty recently. And that's where you can buy works for your home. Um, all the bowls and vases that I have available are pretty much on there. Uh, if you're interested in buying something like that and you don't see it on that site, feel free to send me a DM through Waynestar or through either of my Instagrams or send me a message on either of the websites. I do kind of one-on-one -on -one studio tours some of the time to uh, give folks an idea of what might not be on the website, but is available for purchase. Um, yeah, so that's the whole, that's the whole story. I want to unmute. I want to thank everyone for joining and put one final plug in. If you haven't joined your local alumni club or the RISI network, please do so. Um, I've had some amazing messages from kind of current students and recent alumni about how um, I can help them in their career. And so I'd love for all the other alumni to be in the similar position to be able to do the same thing. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jess, for joining us and sharing all of your amazing process and work. Um, thank you again. And thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Bye, everyone. Bye.